Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of James today. We're going to give it our second um, lecture here. And James, I want you to remember, is the equivalent in the Hebrew of Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. And naturally, uh, in verse 1, we address this to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So this has a special, you want to always rightly divide the Word of God. Well, exactly what does that mean? Well, it means who is it written to? What is the time sequence? This was written about 45 A.D. And uh, it was written basically as it is written to those that were scattered abroad. Uh, it would, Jesus himself would, would at, in John chapter 7, verse 36, would he would say he was going to make a trip. And they, well, is he going to those that are scattered abroad, the children? You know, so basically it was a known thing that the 10 northern tribes had been taken captive in 600 B.C. And uh, Judah and Benjamin taken in 400 uh, B.C. And then gathered them back, but they were scattered. And that's what this is written to. And... What, what um, James is teaching here, James being the brother of our Lord, is when, when you're tried and when you have a few temptations, buck up and consider it, consider it a compliment from the devil, if you would, that you're a servant of the living God and he's trying to aggravate you. And you can cut it. You can plow deep. And let it be a joy to you when, when you are challenged by the enemy. And, and so it is, that, that's confidence, and that's building self-will, confidence, but most of all, faith, and being a hearer, but mostly also a doer. That's what James preaches, be a doer. You can listen all day, you can hear all your life, but if you never do anything, then, you see, God doesn't, pay, doesn't have a payday until you've earned it. And he doesn't give paydays just for hearing. He says, after you, I know all things that you have need of, and after you do these things, I will give you what you need. And that's the way our Father operates. The quicker you learn that, the better off you are, because God always answers prayer to those that hear and do, and, but also wait upon Him. So having said that, we pick it up with the... Um, as he would say, whatever you do, be uh, in the last lecture, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You know, always think it over. Righteous indignation is okay, but make sure you know what you're talking about. So let's pick it up today as, as we uh, left it in the last lecture. Chapter 1, the great book of James, Jacob, uh, in verse 21, and it reads, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness of superfluity, that means excessive or really bad uh, naughtiness, and receive with meekness, that's humbly, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Do, do you know what engrafted means? It's when you graft something in. You know, when, you, when you're, if, let's say, example, if you're grafting a... Um, a paper shell pecan into a native pecan tree. When you graft that paper shell pecan in, which is much larger than the native, but the native tree will support the, the uh, larger pecan, it becomes a part of that tree. And even God himself in the 11th chapter of Romans uses this for the tame olive tree and the wild olive tree. You can be grafted in. In other words, the Word of God becomes a part of you. You understand it, you hear it, you, you, uh, you become a doer of it, 
and it's simply a part of your life and as much as it's grafted in and what does that do? It saves your souls, changes your life, gives you a purpose. It uh, makes you a blessing to other people. Why? Well, because you have the presence of God the, through the Holy Spirit within you. Verse 22. But be ye doers, underline that in your mind, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. In other words, you can, religion is a strange thing, and you know, we have a lot of religious people. And, but religion that is simply by faith is dead. There's no work there. You've got to see the work before you can see the actual hand of God within it. I, I know that upsets a lot of people. Do you know something? When you go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, and you read it, do you know that when you pass from this age, that is to say flesh, into your spirit body and return to the Father, do you know the only thing you can take with you? It's really written real well in uh, Revelation 14, verse 13. Only one thing you can take with you. You can accumulate anything you want to, but there's only one thing that's going with you. It's your work. It follows you because that's what you're judged by and that's what your rewards come from, okay? so. It becomes a very important thing. Hey, no works, no rewards. It's that simple. And, and do you know something? I think everyone, if they'll just think about it, that's fair. That's the way it should be. Verse 23, to, to continue. And uh, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. It's like a, a man looking into a mirror. What do you see? A reflection. What's the reflection of? It's a view. You, you can see yourself there and I mean, hey, it looks pretty good, you know, if you've got her sharpened up, doing good. And, but it still is only a reflection. It's not the real thing. I, I want you to grasp that. I want you to hang on to it. It is still only a reflection. It's not the real thing. It's not really you. Okay. So there, you, what happens when you look into that glass um, and you're um, beholding yourself there? Verse 24, listen carefully. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, that reflection is gone. Zoop gone. That's what your religion is if it's just a reflection, if you're just a hearer and not a doer. All you are is a reflection in life. What kind of rewards does that pay? Zippo, nada, no, nothing. So, well, I just wonder why God never blesses me. Well, it's pretty obvious. All it is was with you, all religion is, is a reflection of what you'd like to see, not what you actually do, what you believe and what you take part in. You are a participant in the Word of God, engrafted in you, grafted in where it becomes a part, and you're a blessing to basically many people that you come in contact with. Why? Because you've got the truth. That's what the truth does for you, grafted in. Take it in and don't ever walk away from it. Don't ever turn your back on it and have the real thing, not just a reflection. Verse 25 to continue. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the word of God, and continueth therein, stays in it, he being not a forgetful hearer. I mean, he, he kind of remembers it, can't remember everything, but he takes in what he can, but a doer of the work. Now, what was that again? A doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed, um, in whatever you're doing. God's going to bless you. 
Listen, a lot of people that wonder why God doesn't bless them need to absorb this. It is so simple, a child can understand it. And, and God's not just uh, puffing smoke here. God always keeps His word. If you want a blessing, follow these rules and be blessed. You don't follow these rules if you're just a reflection and it's gone and you're off going into the ways of the world. Hey, forget it. You haven't got anything coming because you haven't done anything. Therefore, simply, you know, one of the greatest things you can do to please our Father is to let Him know you love Him because that's why He created you for His pleasure. And what He wants most from you is your love. That's just a natural thing. And when you let Him know that you love Him and you peer into that law of liberty, which is to say the law of God that sets you free, it doesn't handcuff you, it doesn't entrap you, it sets you free. Well, well, dear brother, you don't understand. The law will just tie you up, and people in churches will say, if you have, uh, if, if you have done this, that, or the other, you move to the back. Well, I, you know what? If I were you, I wouldn't go to a church that doesn't practice repentance. If someone truly repents in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and some character bring the sin up again, they're an abomination, and their church is an abomination. The beauty of Christianity and the law of liberty is repentance and forgiveness from the living God, where peace comes upon the congregation, which peace comes into the community, because that law, uh, that wonderful law of liberty is grafted into your very being and into the body of Christ. Uh, and how precious that is. That brings blessings from our Heavenly Father. Verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, uh, I want you to first come in out the gate. What does this mean right here? What does this word in the Greek mean? It means um, a ceremonious uh, type, pious uh, belief. Okay. Not that law of liberty we were speaking of in the prior verse. And brideth, bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. If, if you have this pious, and it's all a ceremony, instead of the wonderful, beautiful Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you're playing. You know, simplicity in the way Christ taught as He taught through His own brother James here, Jacob in the Hebrew tongue, to the twelve tribes. You're shortchanging yourself. You're really... I mean, you're not only robbing yourself, but you're robbing all the people that you should be a blessing to. You should be in a position where you can help them, where you can share that law of liberty by teaching truth, by living truth, by having a belief that isn't ceremony or putting on the dog, as we would say in the South, I mean, trying to make a show of things, but living a normal life, being doing others as you would have them do unto you, and loving the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving His blessings. You see, without God's blessings, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to ever, you will never, ever find total happiness and peace of mind without doing it in God's way with that precious law of liberty, and, and uh, which is to say the Word of God, directing you. Again, you know, this is pretty obvious. Uh, you, you ever been around one of these holy Joes that are goody-goody two-shoes? Don't bother me, boy. You go away. I'll be a, I'll be a saint of God. Uh, just don't get too close to me. Now, you know, that's a turn off if you ever saw one. I mean, what kind of example does that set of the humble, meek attitude of our Lord Jesus Christ in bringing salvation to the world? There is no resemblance whatsoever. There is no reflection whatsoever of the saving hand of Almighty God. 
in that type of actions. Our Father opens that law of liberty to whomsoever will. Therefore, even though this is written to the 12 tribes, they're to be a blessing. Abraham was to be a blessing to all nations. Nations is ethnos. That means with even the, the Gentile ethnic people, they're to be a blessing to everyone through the ultimate of salvation, which is to say, Emmanuel, God with us, Christ himself. Well, what could you say about that? Don't try to play church. <clears throat> Be, have the truth grafted in and live it. Be a hearer and a doer, and you'll, be, you'll, you'll do just fine because God will protect you. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's pretty easy to do, but do you understand what it's really talking about? Do you know why you rightly divide the word? So that you understand what's being said. What was verse one? Who is this written to? The 12 tribes scattered abroad. Who are they and what are they? Well, they, they don't know who their father is. They, they call themselves whatever, whatever country they're in, that's what they are. They don't realize they're the children of God. <clears throat> Those 10 tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains were called Caucasian, settled Europe, later Canada, America, and blessed of God beyond means. And, and yet they, they are, you might as well say, orphans because they don't know truly who they are. So what is God telling you here? Teach them who they are. And Mother Israel herself, when she loses who she is, she's a widow. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have Ishai in the Hebrew tongue, which is to say a husband, that is to say Almighty God for that great wedding that's coming someday. It's upon us. And you want to be ready for that. That's what the real church is, is teaching truth, whereby everyone realizes their wonderful, beautiful relationship to Almighty God. You know, it is a strange thing, but you go into some houses calling themselves houses of God, and they would have this picture of a person that's got a pitchfork and ready to throw you right into a burning fire. Let them burn forever. I mean, they absolutely almost paint Satan as God. It's Satan that has the pitchfork, this is figuratively, and the horns, uh, Revelation 13, 11. Not God. Our Father is a Father of love and understanding. He doesn't wake up every morning and look out to find somebody he can zap. He's there to help you. Remember in the last lecture I told you, don't you ever forget Jeremiah 23? Don't you ever say, what burden has God got for us today? Because God doesn't send burdens. And if you accuse him of it, you'll get a burden, all right. He'll, he'll thump your gourd big time. Okay. So, that's what the true word is, is letting people know God loves them. And you can find salvation by being a hearer and being a doer. That's loving God. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Don't you play favorites. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't want you to be. And, and you shouldn't, well, well what, what, does, what does this mean? Well, you know, uh, well, let's read on. Verse 2, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, ooh, look at it, in goodly apparel, ooh, sharp, money, money, okay. And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, Verse 3, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing 
and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. You take the best seat in the house and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. That means under my authority is what it means uh, figuratively. Don't ever be a respecter of persons in that sense. Do you know something? Some of the richest people in the world may not have a dime, but the reason they are rich is they're a servant of the living God and love Him, and it reflects from them. Their mirror walks around with them. They're a blessing to all the people they come in contact with because you can see the grafting of Almighty God, the law of liberty within them. And they're a hearer and a doer. And maybe they don't have a dime. Now, which is the bigger blessing to your assembly? The gay character in the clothing, that is to say wearing gay clothing with the big rings and everything, who will be the better help to receive God's blessings? I think the answer is pretty simple. Don't be a respecter of persons. Almighty God is not. Verse 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, if you allow that, and are become judges of evil thoughts? You're double-minded. You're one of those characters from chapter 1, verse 8, is double-minded. They're worthless. You, you know, a double-minded person, you never know for sure who you're going to be talking to. They'll change from one day to the next. It's according to who they're talking to, who's their friend, uh, you know. Instead of honest, straightforward, who and whomever loves and serves Almighty God to be, to be loving and understanding and recognize faithfulness to the living God and be able to recognize the law of liberty grafted into one because it reflects from them in the very light that they put forth in the reflection of the light, which is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't have anything to do, you know, you, you have anything to do with a double-minded person that you have to put responsibility on them, you're wasting your time, you're, you're bringing yourself a headache. You want the person that you can depend on, that you can trust, that is honest, that you know what he's going to be this morning and you know what he will be tomorrow morning. Then you can trust that person and God will bless um, whatever uh, that um, uh, duty that you're trying to perform uh, brings forth. God will bless it. Verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, they own it all, which he hath promised to them that love him. That, th those that do what? Those that wear the gay clothing? Those that have the big gold ring? Th no, no, those that love him. Uh, I, I want to I make it real clear. There's nothing wrong, there's no sin in being rich with God's blessings. As long as you love God and God has loved you enough that he's seen that you are rich. Because, because God, has, God promises His blessings of richness if, if you obey Him, if you're a doer of His Word, and if it is necessary in your service to Him to be rich, He'll make you that way. And don't ever apologize for it. That's blessings of God. But don't ever be riches in the ways of the world. That's sinful, greed, lies, bad contracts, ripping off people, lying to people. That's what this world is about. It isn't the honesty and straightforwardness of the face of a child of God that you can love and trust and know that um, they're, they're real. And again, value uh, as far as monetary is concerned has really very little to do with it. 
It's what's in your heart, your mind, your soul. Verse 6, But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? They'll drag you right out of there. They'll, they'll draw you. They put, all they care about is getting ahead. Well, what in the world could you do about that? Well, if, if you were a real Christian, you, would, you and your partner would find an arbitrator where you wouldn't go where you had to have some slick lawyers to take whatever funds are available in this uh, agreement. They're, they're going to rip you off and get it anyway. But if you have a Christian arbitrator, neither of you lose anything, and a good arbitrator is going to do what is fair because he will do it by the law of liberty. That is to say, what is just and what is right. So don't let people drag you out of the assembly into the ways of the world and rip you off, mock you, degradate you in the world itself. Uh, take care of business, do it God's way with the law of liberty. Don't judge people. Seven, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? They, they uh, unfortunately will blaspheme even Christ. They will mock Christianity. They will giggle and snicker if you make a Christian statement. In some nations today, it is very dangerous even for a Christian church. They will walk in and gun down everybody in a Christian church in certain parts of the world today. It happens uh, quite regularly at this time. And I'm speaking about in Egypt and in other places, Christians in Iraq are being murdered. Churches I'm talking about. So you see, um, it... Uh, when, but don't, no, don't worry, God takes care of these things. God takes note, and so it is. But um, uh, the, the point being, use God's knowledge and wisdom and stay clear whereby you can be a blessing and a service and accomplish what it is that God would have you do. You do it by following Him. Verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That's the, one of the oldest commandments in the word. Okay. Do as others as you'd have them do of you. What, what is this uh, royal law? Well, how many kings of kings do you have? Okay. There's only one. It's his law, his word. That is his word. And uh, do your neighbor as you would have. If it's possible, get along with your neighbor. Some neighbors it's impossible, but uh, try. <clears throat> Verse 9. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. Never show respect of persons. Treat everyone the same, especially if you're in the assembly. Do that. Intuitively, you know by spiritual discernment the value of a person, basically. That's not judging. That's simply discerning. And finances have nothing to do with it. And when it comes to dispensing the royal law, do not play favorites. It goes to all. Verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And that's the way it is. You know, if you, you, you um, well, let's go one more verse. 11, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. That's fonyance. Do not murder. Commit a, a criminal homicide in the Greek. Now, if thou commit not a, no adultery, and yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In other words, if you're going to go totally by the law, then, then uh, 
well, if you break one, you've broken them all. Why? If you depend on the law for your salvation, then naturally if you break one, you're not going to make it. But we don't depend, we depend on the law as a governor keeping us out of trouble. These things you should not do. If you do them, you're going to be in trouble. But then when you do, repent and get God's forgiveness if that be possible. Because the law of liberty, well, what does that law say? It says if you repent, if you have a change of heart and a change of mind, seven times 70, 490 times repent you'll be forgiven. So, and it's according to what degree of fonyance you commit as to whether there are certain that demands capital punishment. If it is a, a capital punish, murder for no reason whatsoever, no jealousy, n no law of passion involved, just simply a wicked person. God wants them up there. But the point being, if you break one law, you break them all if you're depending on the law to get you to heaven. Why not depend on the Savior himself and the royal law of forgiveness, of repentance, of salvation? And you will do a lot better. Verse 12, let's continue. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty then? It's forgiveness. It's the new covenant. Verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. In other words, um, uh, uh, mercy trumps or, or um, it uh, trumps, um, you might say, judgment. It does. It triumphs over it. Love does. Love for what? Love for the Word, love for the Father and His forgiveness. Then with that, we have that repentance and how precious it is. I want to go one more verse, 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, Though a man say he had faith and hath not works, can faith save him? One more, 15. If a brother or a sister be naked, well, we'll stop there. We'll pick that up there in the next lecture. Faith and works go together. Because if you love Almighty God, if you are not a respecter of persons, if you serve under the law of liberty, then you're going to do the work of believing and of, of witnessing, planting a seed when you have the opportunity, but, or, but most of all, letting God know you love Him. That's what, brings the, that's what brings the blessings, is your contact with the living God, letting Him know that you love Him so that His mercy abounds in your life. It triumphs over all other things. Why? Well, you're his child. And being a child of God, then God will always bless you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. 
And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. We have one judge, and he, he does not need our help. You do have the right to discern spiritually who you should listen to, who you should fellowship with, but be not a respecter of persons as our Father so instructs. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure having you and hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? Well, God, God's your Father. He knows what you're thinking. He's a cardio knower, meaning he knows your heart. You don't even have to say it out loud. So let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your mercy, your love. Okay. So give it to him, and he returns that love with blessings. He's your father. Let him know you love him. Once you do that, Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Paul from Florida. And Paul says, ask, if you get divorced, can you get married again, or is it considered adultery? This is one of those matters, uh, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Now, if divorce is not the unpardonable sin, then naturally that means it can be pardoned if you repent. Even if it was your fault, on repentance, it's wiped clean. Now, there are, on the other hand, even by God's law, the law of liberty, reasons for a legitimate divorce. Okay. And I won't go into that. It's a different time for a lesson for a different time. But beside the point, the most beautiful thing of Christianity is that when you do have a change of heart, when you do have a change of mind, and you ask Him to forgive you, it doesn't exist anymore. And naturally, you're free to, to um, remarry. Because in a sense, once it's forgiven, you were never married to start with. Timothy from, I don't know where Timothy's from. Can you please explain why you said when Ham uncovered the nakedness of his father means he had sex with his mother? Thank you. It's, it's God's word. That is a figure of speech, a metaphor, a Hebrew idiom. I, I want you to read Leviticus chapter, I'm going to read it. Leviticus chapter 20, 11. It seems I get this um, question quite often, and it seems like people just cannot absorb it. What is uncovering your father's nakedness? Do you believe God's word? Then listen to it. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife, that needs no explanation, I hope, hath uncovered his father's nakedness. That's what it means. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And naturally, inasmuch as it happened with him, it was the original and the law was not in existence at that time. But God still considered it so. Well, brother, you don't understand. You see, technically it says there that they walked backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Well, again, what is there? father's nakedness is their mother. That's why they walk backwards, okay. out of respect and dignity. I really think that um, add Leviticus 18.8 8 to that. That's God's law, okay? It's not my saying that. That's the way it is. That's the law of liberty. Ella from Connecticut. My question is about communion. Are we supposed to do it together, or should staff members do it first while others follow? I would like to know what God's Word says about it. Thank you. 
Well, I, I can only tell you, I'm not going to judge what other people do because many people have different um, methods of taking the Lord's table. But at Shepherd's Chapel, I don't care if there's 4,000 present. We pass the bread to where each of the 4,000 has the bread in hand, including myself. And we all partake of that bread at exactly the same time. And then the cup is passed to 4,000 people. And once everyone is served, and not until, for we are not respecters of persons, and then we each take a cup, including myself, and we partake of that cup at the same time, because we're one assembly, one family. So that's the way we do it. I'm not going to judge how other people do it. Uh, you have to make your own mind up about that, and so be it. Uh, Sam from, I don't know where Sam, maybe Sam's from Sam Hill. Maybe that's what it is. We'll see here. Okay. I agree that there is no rest without, you're about out of paper, aren't you, dude? I'm telling you, it's, that's pretty small. I agree that there is no rest without Christ as far as how the Sabbath goes. But my question is this, why did Jesus say pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Well, it's real simple. What, what is the, I mean, this is harvest time. Let's say you're quoting from Mark chapter 13. Um, you're, you're, wh when is harvest? Well, sure not in the middle of winter. Kamun, you would say. Kaimon, that's a, a, a Greek word. Um, it's summer. Don't be. What it's saying is, is don't be harvested out of season, which means um, don't be harvested by the Antichrist. Wait for the true Christ. But how about pray that it's not the Sabbath? Well, the the point is getting out of Jerusalem because that's where God says there's not going to be one stone left standing atop another after the Antichrist appears there. You need to get out of Dodge. Is what he's saying though many of us will be delivered up. But it, it is, again, a figure of speech. You could not go over three-quarters of a mile on the Sabbath, and that is not far enough to escape uh, the destruction of Mount Zion when God cleanses it. But then we don't have to, you, you want to realize, you don't have to worry anyway, because at that instant we're all changed into spiritual bodies, and it would have no effect upon you anyway. Okay, Sharon from Minnesota, um, I, I have been listening to you for over a year. Okay, thank you, and you learned so much in that year. Thank you. My question is this. My mother says, one way to tell the Antichrist from the true Christ is by the nail marks in his hands. Could you comment on this? Well, I would, I would want more proof than that because Satan is able to, to uh, fudge to make it appear that he even has nail marks. It is true that Christ will still have them. Revelation chapter 1 documents that. What, long about verse 7? Somewhere along there. But um, the fact is, what happens at the seventh trump when he returns? We're all changed into spiritual bodies. So probably one of the better things to remember, as long as you're in a flesh body, and they tell you he's in the desert or somewhere else, don't go. It's the wrong one. As long as you're in a flesh body, the true Christ has not, I mean absolutely, unequivocally, has not returned. It's the fake. And the fake always comes first, so you can't go too far wrong on that. Adam from Arkansas. And Adam wants to know, will you please explain what it says, uh, young, where it's, what, where it says young men will see visions and dreams. Well, it's written in Acts chapter 2 and, Malach, and, um, and as well as in Joel chapter 2. Acts 2, Joel 2. What it is is when you're delivered up before the false Messiah, the Holy Spirit's going to speak through you as it's written in Mark 13. But it's not only sons and young men, it's old men, but it's women also. 
God's not a respecter of persons. He uses men and women to witness against the false Christ. Uh, Dale from Oregon, when the people are delivered up in front of the Antichrist, will it be the people who are left on earth or is it everyone rather than are dead or alive? Well, it's those that are on earth. It's those, this is why it is written, and many people are confused by it, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Oh, just exactly what does that mean? Those that were first chosen in the first earth age will be in the last generation to make the stand against Antichrist. Well, why would that be? Because God knows he can trust them. God knows they will stand. They're not going to run. They're not cowards. They're not wimps. They're going to stand against the false Messiah and, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. And that brings him down. That's... Um, the reason, and that's the being, okay? And then comes the millennium, and many in paradise will return to earth. Michelle from, Michael rather, from Florida. I was wondering how you get the information on Joseph of Arimathea and him being the uncle of Jesus. Well, he was the kinsman redeemer. In other words, you, that, that gives you a legal reason to be able to claim the body. A pure stranger can't run in and say, well, I, I'd like that to be my grandpa. I claim that body, and the real family might uh, shoot you. I'm not shoot you, but they'd be very upset. You have to be the nearest of kin to claim the body. Joseph of Arimathea claimed, and rightfully so, um, by law, was able to claim the body of Christ because he was his nearest of kin at that time present. And... Uh, and besides that, in history, as, as you've heard me say, in Glastonbury there were ten mines. That's why Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. He went to Glastonbury, England, and he had mines there for ten and brought that ten back. You, you go to Glastonbury today, and you would have the Glastonbury thorn, which is tied into this. You would have... Um, uh, signs even of a, a boat with a little lad in the front of the, the bow of that little boat and a man at the tiller. The man is Joseph and the child is Christ. And then you would have the cross and, and many, many proofs of this. Uh, it's, it's history, his story. Francis, from, get the, we have a book called The Traditions of Glastonbury. It would help you a lot if you wish to have what is written. Francis from Tennessee, who is Melchizedek? Well, what, what, does, what are you saying when you say Melchizedek? Melcha in the Hebrew tongue is king, and Zedek is the just or the upright, or God's elect. In other words, the king of the elect. Well, who is the king of the elect? Well, I don't know how many kings you got. We have only, as a Christian, you only have one. And when you read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, it will tell you that Melchizedek was as the Son of God. Why? Because he was. He was as, as Christ because he was Christ, that Christ that would be. That's why that Abraham would tithe to him, even in the Old Testament. Uh, Christ, the, the Holy Spirit, was with God even in the creation of this earth age and even the one before. David from Ohio, did the flood of Noah last 40,000 years? Absolutely not. It was exactly one solar year from the time they entered till they came out. We just taught Genesis, and if you'll go back and check your notes, I would, would teach that and you would have a note of it. Uh, Carmen from Michigan, I thought that we Christians would be gone up with the rapture and then the Antichrist would come. Is that the way it is? I've got some bad news for you, Carmen. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Somebody's been pulling your leg, okay? There's no such thing as the rapture. It's not written. Do you believe men or do you believe God's word? That's what you got to make your mind up. Now, where, where most people get this rapture doctrine is 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 
chapter 4, beginning with verse 14, what does it say? You know, a child can understand it. There's no need in being confused about it. Certainly the word rapture is not there. What does it say in the 14th verse? It says, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, and surely you do or you wouldn't be a Christian, you know he did. You know he ascended back to the Father. Then it says, you better believe also those that sleep in him have risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. They're already gone. If you believe Christ resurrected, you better believe they have also. They're in paradise. And then it continues on until it gets to the seventh trump. And at the, that's the last. That's when Christ returns. But the sixth trump is when we stand against the Antichrist, and you're going to be there. If you're still alive at that time, and it's going to happen in this generation, you're either going to stand against the Antichrist or he's going to take you with him, one or the other. Do you know what the Antichrist message is? I'm going to fly you away. You're going to go on a long trip, and I'm right with you. I am Messiah, only he's lying. And God told us over and over he will come first, he will lie and um, deceive many people See that it doesn't happen to you. I got some bad news for you. When it says we'll meet him in the air, that word ar means the spirit of life body, meaning not in the atmosphere, but in our spiritual body we meet him because at the seventh trump we're changed into it and they as well as they and we're all in that same dimension. That's all it's talking about. You know, it is really pretty simple. I suppose some people would say, well, it would really take a scholar to see that and understand it. No, it really wouldn't. If you would just go by the laws of language and forget what man has said and what Satan has instilled in churches and read what God has to say and let it flow. It says, there is no way that we who are alive and remain can precede those that are dead. Well, how could that be? Because they're already gone. You cannot precede somebody that's already there. Okay, it's that simple. A child can understand it. I'll say it again. I know that that ticks some people off when I say that, but nevertheless, it is so simple that um, you'd have a hard time not seeing the truth of it if you will erase the recapping that church after church has played upon the old casing until it's kind of hard to get to the truth. Listen to what God says for yourself. No one will be between you and God on Judgment Day. It's just you. And he wrote this letter to you. You read it. Uh, Jody from Illinois. Um, you and your staff are the best. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Pastor, just, uh, just reading the Word, but you all read the Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, uh, then explain it. God bless you. Keep up the good work. Question. Pastor, I always say since I was a child that if you love the Lord with all your heart and, and obey His Word, it will be just as easy to do right then as to do wrong. Am I right or am I wrong? I listen... I'll be listening for your answer. It's true that it makes if you if you study God's word and it is engrafted in you, it makes it a lot easier to do what's right. Yes, of course. Uh, Mary from North Carolina, what do you mean by saying that it's a sin to teach God's people to fly? And what does the fly mean? It means to rapture. That's what it means. And it, that's not me saying that. That's biblical. I'm going to read it again. We get this question over and over and over, and sometimes it helps if I just go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 13. And if, if I go to verse 20, I could go to verse 18 where it says, Woe to those that sow pillows over every digit. That means index of my fingers, of my outreach saving arms and try to snow people about true salvation. That's verse 18. 
and will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die, to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. This is talking to preachers. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, that's to say those things you sow over my hands, wherewith you there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear. And deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. He's against it. I don't know why people insist on believing it. And especially if you get a newer version of the King James, they've changed this to where it's birds flying. You know, well, who, well, who would change this to birds flying? The Kenites. They're Satan's little disciples. And naturally, they're going to change it if they get a chance. Well, um, Christians maybe don't understand. They don't if they don't study. That's why God sent you the letter, to read it for yourself and understand. But that's what it means. God's against teaching people to fly to save their souls when His outreaching arms are there. And I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for studying the letter He has sent to you, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you are well grafted into the law of liberty. It makes his day when you make his, he makes yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. And bless God, he will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me good now. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.